few weeks ago, we took a look at some obscure secrets, trivia, and hidden details in Ocarina of Time. From giant versions of normal enemies to the secret hidden abilities of the Skull Mask and Bunny Hood. It was a lot of fun to make, so why not have a look at my personal favourite 3D Zelda title, The Wind Waker. Subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content, and let's look at some things in The Wind Waker that you might not know about. All-purpose bait can be bought from Beedle's shop ship, and can be scattered to attract various animals. It's mainly used to lure fishmen, who will fill in Link's sea chart, but can also be fed to the huge pig on Outset Island so that he'll dig up a piece of heart. But all-purpose bait isn't called all-purpose for no reason. It can also be placed outside of rat holes found in certain dungeons, luring out rats who'll sell items to Link. It can also be fed to maniblins, who'll be distracted enough by the bait to stop attacking. But by far my favourite use for bait in the game is towards the very end, during the fight against Puppet Ganon's snake form. This boss is one of the more difficult fights in the game, as Link needs to hit the puppet's vulnerable tail while it slithers quickly around the room. But if we chuck down some bait, Puppet Ganon will just forget about Link for a minute and instead start circling the bait. Following the puppet Ganon battles, Link climbs to the roof of Ganon's Dark Tower, ready to take on the King of Evil in a final, decisive battle for the fate of Hyrule. But the hero isn't alone. For most of the battle, he fights alongside Princess Zelda, who uses the light arrows to stun the Gerudo. It's not the most difficult battle by any means, but Ganondorf does hit hard. Luckily, there's an easy way to fill up hearts. Using the grappling hook on Zelda will pinch a heart from the princess, every time. The grappling hook is of course used to steal items from enemies throughout the game, so it's cool to see that the Zelda team wanted to reward players for using it on the princess. Piecing together the Triforce of Courage is a long sequence, where Link must find maps and have them deciphered to reveal the shard's locations, before using the grappling hook at the right spot to heave up the treasure. Interestingly though, if Link narrowly misses the Triforce's location, he can hoist up something different. A weathered metal pot, covered in barnacles. Link shakes his head in dismay, and then drops it back into the sea, and a giant octorok appears. As far as I can tell, this pot can only be found before Link pulls up the Triforce piece, and it won't appear again afterwards, it's just meant to be junk that the player can find while searching. The fact that it's a pot is significant though. Octopus pots are fishing traps, which have been used since ancient times, especially in Japan where they're known as Takotsubo. These heavy pots are left in the sea, in the hopes that a poor octopus will find one and use it to shelter in, before it's hoisted up to catch it. So this is most likely what the large octorok is about here. It was inside the metal pot, and when Link rudely yanked its home out of the sea, it attacks. The ghost ship appears only in the dead of night, a crewless, haunting vessel bound to the cycles of the moon. Depending on the version, the ghost ship houses either a Triforce shard or chart, and so must be tracked down and boarded by Link. The ship is infested with ghost-like enemies, whiz robes and pose, and only after their defeat does a ladder drop down, allowing access to the small cabin in which the Triforce piece is stored. This is where things get a bit strange. After Link obtains the treasure, a scream echoes out. Interestingly, this scream is actually based on an unused audio clip assigned to Jaboon, the water spirit, played sped up. Jaboon, of course, was most likely set to play a larger role in the game, which was cut down due to time constraints, and this scream sound suggests a darker story for the deity. Nintendo often edit and reuse existing sounds in their games, like how Ocarina of Time's Stal Children use a sped up version of Phantom Ganon's laugh, so it's cool to see here too. The Wind Waker's notable for having Link voice acted in some small ways, a rare occurrence for good reason. When using the command melody to control statues or his companions, he'll shout Come on! And when sneaking after Mila on Windfall Island, he'll even meow like a cat. <coughs> but Link isn't the only voice-acted character. There's also the Choo Choo's. 
Choo Choo's are small, blob-like minor enemies, teardrop-shaped slime creatures who come in a variety of different colours, and drop jelly used in making potions. They've appeared in many different games in the series, but in The Wind Waker they make a distinctive, chaotic, chattering noise. It doesn't sound like anything, but if slowed down and played in reverse, it's actually an argument between two Japanese men. I don't speak Japanese, but according to this Did You Know Gaming post, it's possible to hear, at least I'm not balding, and looking like you are, people will think you're a monster. Stalfos are a Zelda staple enemy, ever since their appearance in the very first game in the series. Usually, Stalfos take the form of humanoid skeletons, but in The Wind Waker, they're a little more bestial. They're huge, monstrous skeletons who can only be defeated if their head is destroyed. Like most of the game's enemies, they're full of character. Their animations are exaggerated and cartoonish, and there's a couple of brilliant details that are easily missed. First, an easy way to beat them. It's possible to blow up the Stalfos' body with a bomb, and then crush its head with a skull hammer in a single blow, making the fight much easier. But one of my favourite details in the game is what happens if Link picks up the Stalfos' club and holds it. Without a weapon, the monster will have to come up with an alternative, so it rips off its own arm to beat Link with. It's easily missed, but it's hilarious. The Savage Labyrinth is one of the game's toughest challenges, a brutal gauntlet of nearly every single one of the game's enemies, from Keese and Bokoblins right up to multiple Dark Nuts at once. Halfway through the Labyrinth, players are rewarded by a Triforce chart or shard, depending on the version, which is the only compulsory part of the dungeon, but players can continue down through the other floors, eventually winning themselves the hero's charm. However, this wasn't always the case. In the original, the hero's charm isn't obtained from the labyrinth, it's instead given to Link by Miss Marie, the teacher on Windfall Island. Instead, the final floor of the Savage Labyrinth rewards Link with a piece of heart, a fitting prize for the player going out of their way to finish this challenge. But in the Japanese version of the original, the final floor's reward isn't the hero's charm, or even a piece of heart. It's... 10 rupees. That's it. For whatever reason, this was changed between the Japanese and Western versions of the GameCube game. If I had to guess, probably because people didn't want to finish the labyrinth for a joke reward. Of course, the piece of heart found in the updated labyrinth was pulled from elsewhere in the world, so that the total pieces in the world remained the same. There are a few pieces of heart found in different places between versions, and in the Japanese version, one can be found in the secret chest underneath Grandma's house, which only contains rupees in other versions. Maybe Japanese Grandma had just beaten Link to the punch. She'd already cleared the labyrinth and claimed the piece of heart as her own. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, leave a like or subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time. The ghost ship houses a Triforce shot. <laughs>